Thank you. Welcome and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I'm Chad Ripley, pastor here at Abundant Life, and I'm so happy to have you here with us to celebrate. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to celebrate how far down you had to reach to reach us. We thank you for that. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you that we can come together with family and friends and worship you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bombers Box are going to be lighting our Advent tree tonight. Let's stand and sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. You may be seated. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. For a child is born to us, unto us a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government 
and its peace will know no end. Let's see. Looks like we've got a couple fingers missing. We're going to go to Micah mm -hmm. chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. All right, now we'll have the Rosen Gauss sing for us. We've got a, what a glorious night. Is that right?
Jonathan and Amanda would like to come sing, Come on, Ring Those Bells. Reading from Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn.
continuing in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping their watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone throughout around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests.
Continuing in Luke chapter 2, now at verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told.
Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. We have the men's chorus singing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear.
Christmas is my favorite time of year, as it is for so many of us. I love the crisp, cold nights sitting in front of a fireplace. I love gathering with family and friends, opening presents in the soft glow of Christmas tree lights. But why do we celebrate Christmas? What's it all about? In the Gospel of Luke, we've been reading that familiar Christmas passage. Now in those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all the people were on the way to register for the census, each to his own city. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. He He was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had departed from them into heaven, The shepherds began saying to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to Joseph and Mary and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen him, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed by the things that were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things in her heart, pondered them, in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. We're reading about a baby born 2,000 years ago in a tiny town in Israel in such poverty that he was laid in a manger, an animal's trough in a barn. How can that be good news of great joy for all people? The angel said, For today in the city of David there's been born for you a Savior, who's Christ the Lord. A Savior? Savior from what? Well, to answer that question, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Adam and Eve were the first man and woman on earth. And the Bible says they had a special relationship with God. They talked to him face to face, the way we talk to each other. They walked with him in the Garden of Eden. It's amazing to think that we were created to have a relationship like that with our God. That type of friendship. But looking at the world today, it's not hard to see we don't have that kind of close friendship with God anymore, do we? So what happened? Well, there's something in all of us that we know isn't right, something that's broken. It's so easy for us to be unkind. It's so easy for us to fall into addictions, whether it's to food or sex, drugs, alcohol, other bad habits that we just can't control. And if we do feel like we have those tamped down, what about our thoughts? I'm not running around having affairs or getting drunk, but what if you got to see every single thought I've ever had? I've got some thoughts I would be ashamed of. (coughs) 
The Bible calls those things sin. It's not a very popular word anymore. Perhaps it never was. But that's what the Bible calls it. The Old prophet, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said, But your wrongdoings have caused a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So our wrongdoings, our unkindness, our mistakes, our sins are the things that separate us from God, that keep us from that relationship. Those are the things that even keep them from hearing our prayers. And it gets worse. The Apostle Paul wrote, for the wages of sin is death. Now most of us have worked for an hourly wage at one time or another. Wages were something that we earned, something that we deserved. As a matter of fact, if we worked a 40-hour week and we didn't get a paycheck at the end of that, we'd be mad. We'd say, I want what I deserve. I want what I earned. Well, Paul's saying that what we've earned by our sins, what we deserve, our wages, is death. And he's not just talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death, which is being separated from God forever in a place called hell. But fortunately, Paul didn't stop there. He said, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It isn't God's plan that we be separated from him. The most famous verse in the Bible is John 3, 16. You've seen that on a cardboard sign at almost every sporting event for decades, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's why on that first Christmas, the angel said he had good news of great joy for all people because God had sent his own son. Jesus lived on this earth just like us. He was tempted by the same things we're tempted by but he didn't sin. You know, when I ask somebody, why do you think God would let you into his heaven? If he said, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Most people say, well, you know, I, I'm a good person. I'm a pretty good person. Okay, fair enough. But how good is good? Better than Al Capone? Well, I think I'm there. That's pretty easy. Better than Mother Teresa? Oh, that's harder. What's the standard? Well, God's standard is holiness. That means perfection. I am nowhere near perfect. I've fallen short of God's standard. And so have you. Paul wrote, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us met that standard until Jesus did. He lived a perfect life. He didn't deserve to die. But instead of receiving what he deserved for that perfect life, he took what we deserve for our sins, death, on a cross. Have you ever gotten a gift for Christmas that you just, huh, you didn't like? So a couple days later, you went back to the store and exchanged it. This is the greatest gift exchange of all time. Jesus is offering to exchange his righteousness for our sin, the death that we deserve for the life he deserves. And death couldn't hold him. Three days after his death on the cross, he rose again from the dead. Death is defeated. Jesus paid the price for our sin so that we wouldn't have to pay it. He was separated from God so that we could be joined back to God. That's the good news of Christmas. That's why we give gifts to each other. It's to remember the incredible gift that God gave to us. You can receive that amazing gift that friendship with God, that eternal life. You can do that today, this Christmas season, and pray a prayer like this. 
believers, I'll let you pray it with me. Dear God, I know that I've done the wrong thing. I know that I've sinned and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died for my sins on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven and that he rose again from the dead. I want to turn away from those sins and turn to you. I ask Jesus to save me from my sins and to be my Lord, my boss, from now on. Amen. Friends, that's why we celebrate this holiday season. That's the good news of Christmas. May you experience the greatest gift ever given this Christmas season. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time tonight, I'd love to hear about it after the service. Come get me. Now we've got a quartet singing Savior.
came to save and to heal and restore. All the power and the honor and the glory is yours. Savior, oh Savior, a child. have a violin solo. Sumaya. When I look back there, I don't think I've ever seen somebody so eager to do special music. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. We're going to do a candle lighting now. What we'll do, if, if you hold your candle when it's lit straight up, the person next to you will light theirs from yours. Tip yours to mine. There we go. Mm -hmm.
Jesus, thank you for coming to us at Christmas time. Thank you for reaching down so far to reach us. Thank you for the opportunity to be back in fellowship with you, to have the friendship with God that we were meant to have. Please be with us all as we go back to our homes tonight. Keep us safe. Let us experience your greatest gift this season. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. May the wonder of Christ's very personal love for you overwhelm you and make your knees weak. May the reality of may the reality that he came to earth to seek and save the lost give you your heart for those who've lost their way. May the power of his Holy Spirit within you compel you to walk by faith and not by sight. May the promise of his unconditional love compel you to dream big, take risk, and give generously. As you wrap up this year, may you wear his grace like a beautiful robe. May you entrust your missteps to him, and may you trust him to transform you from the inside. A very blessed and Merry Christmas to you. Let's stand for our closing hymn.
Cardiff Smith. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.